and welcome to everybody to this important and exciting town hall. Older people, like everyone else in the world, have the same rights to life and health amid the COVID-19 pandemic. And this was said by United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. As the death toll of older people from the virus continues to climb, the need to strengthen programs and policies affecting older persons, both in times of crisis and afterward, are important. We have the great pleasure of being in conversation today with Ms. Ira Lipsky, Head of Rehabilitation and, Re and Reablement at JDCE. And we're going to explore interdisciplinary strategies and practices that respect and protect the rights of older people as communities and societies begin to transition out of a crisis mode and into a new normal. But let me tell you a little bit about JDC Eshell. JDC Eshell aims to improve the well-being of vulnerable older adults in Israel by advancing their autonomy, functionality, and independence. Since 1969, Eshell is Israel's social research and development incubator, tasked with developing comprehensive responses to the very many complex challenges faced by Israeli society with the aging of its population. Many of the 1.1 million older people in Israel benefit directly and indirectly from a rich variety of services and programs designed and developed by Israel. Now, um, Ira has just a fascinating background. Um, so let me talk with you a little bit about Ira before I hand the floor over to her. Ira is head of JDC Eshell's Re Rehabilitation and Reablement Division. Upon her arrival to Israel in 1999, she assumed a series of roles in JDC's former Soviet Union department in Jerusalem, including regional coordinator for the Volga region, and regional coordinator for Moscow and Siberia. She also served as founding director of the School for NGO Leadership and Management in Moscow. From 2008 to 2010, Ira was JDC, JDC's representative in Georgia, working with local community to develop local self-sufficiency and financial independence while also maintaining services and activities for the Georgian Jewish community. In 2016, Ira was appointed co-director of JDC Field Operations Division, overseeing their operations in Moldova and Ukraine, including efforts to help those affected by the crisis in Eastern Ukraine. We are really, um, going, we're, we're in for a, just a wonderful conversation with Ira. And we thank Ira and her colleagues, Hanny and Noam, and all those in Eshell for being with us today. And we're very proud at IFA because uh, JDC Eshell just became a member of IFA. And I have a personal love of Israel and JDC Eshell because it was Professor Yitzhak Brick, um, who was president at the time of IFA, that. Um, you know, was my president when I first started at IFA. So um, thank you all for being on the call. And uh, Ira, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jane, for such a warm welcoming um, and good time of the day, everybody. It's afternoon in Israel, but I understand that here's people almost all over the world. So some of you having breakfast, some maybe already have a lunch or dinner. I'm very thrilled to be here today and to share with you JDC's actual perspective on how COVID-19 will influence our future life, what changes we will need to make in order to serve the elderly population in the best way possible. As more corners of the country begin to slowly reopen following the spread of COVID-19, everyone is adjusting their day-to-day -day lives slowly adapting to changes in new routines. For many organizations, businesses, and individuals, it's a challenging shift as there is no real precedent. 
in this situation, when there is no blueprint for anyone, we thought that some essential planning assumptions need to be developed in order to make this transition as smooth as possible. Even in Israel, which, you know, a, we are living in a country which is very well familiar with the emergency situations, and still we, like any, any other part in the world, we face a very new and very unfamiliar reality. It's important to say that Eshel started the strategic planning process about a year before the pandemic's outbreak. Back then, we drew out our strategic direction around the prevention of decline or dependency due to health, social, or economic risks among the elderly. While developing the strategy into more operational terms, we came with three main indicators of the successful aging we wanted to improve in Israel, functionality and health, social well-being, and economic resilience. In addition, we spoke about digital literacy as a mandatory skill, which must be improved among the elderly population if we want them to stay connected and relevant. The coronavirus has changed our world forever. Going to eat, Catching a flight, commuting to work, taking care of our loved ones may never be the same. So what does it mean to transit from the crisis to the routine? What does it look to go back to normal when normal is no longer? And like Jane mentioned in the beginning, the whole community now speaks about the new normal. But what is the life in this new normal will look like? and how particularly the approach for elderly care will be influenced. As a basis for our planning discussions in Eshel, we used the famous hammer and the dance metaphor, which was famously uh, uh, dubbed by the Silicon Valley guy, Thomas Payer, who that way called the period of lockdown to squelch the disease as a hammer and the su subsequent period of living with it is a dance. The Israeli government acted very quickly, declaring lockdown in the middle of March. An emergency situation of lockdown is what they called the hammer. This strategy had a massive short term advantage. Social and physical distancing was the first line of defense in order to stop the virus spread and to save the lives, especially of the most vulnerable. It was an extremely important step, as while only 17% of 17,000 infected people were aged 65 plus, the share of elderly among those who died was almost 95%. So the immediate need was to save lives. This stage lasted for, a for almost 50 days. After we hammered the coronavirus, we controlled it and we were in much better shape to address it. And here comes the art of dance, the longer term effort to keep the virus contained until there is a vaccine while managing a sort of routine in the shadow of corona. This shift from lockdown to opening the economy, from sheltering to a dance of testing, tracing, isolating and testing again, the dance of civilians, tracking and control. We understand that we have succeeded in flattering the curve and now we are entering what we call the routine of the corona year and pray that there will not be second hit of the virus. Nobody actually knows how long this period will last. And in this time of uncertainty, we also need to face the problems that the social distancing recommendation have exacerbated. Regardless of living situation, interaction, interactions with anyone outside the home have been severely limited for everyone. For the 30% of Israeli elderly who live alone, this has meant little to no human contact for months. 
Thus, in order to handle this transition, we monitored very closely the needs of the elderly during the lockdown and after it, trying to understand the emerging needs and their scope. Immediate basic needs like food, medicine, and medical treatment, followed by loneliness and depression, fragility and physical and cognitive decline. While moving to a new routine, it was important for us to check if and how corona influenced on the parameters and indicators of successful aging that I mentioned in the beginning of our meeting, functionality and health, social well-being, and economic resilience. Our strategy was very consistent before the pandemic as the reality was consistent, but what is now? I would like to share with you some findings on the most recent survey that we held in mid-May, just in the beginning of the dense period among about 700 elderly from different geographic locations, various socio socioeconomic and health situations. 51%, a half, reported decline in their physical condition. 30% reported a significant decline in functional ability. The lack of any kind of physical activity, lack of motivation to move, catalyzed the cognitive and physical deterioration. One third feels lonely and about 25% are depressed. I must say that the numbers are quite close to those before Corona. It could be explained probably mainly by the very high level of the family values in Israel. On a personal level, I can tell you that I usually call my parents once a day. During Corona, I call them two or even three times, checking what's going on, how do they feel, if they need something. They live in different cities, so I even couldn't, during the lockdown, couldn't visit them. The other explanation is that the survey was done very close to the beginning of the dense period, and we all know that there is a sort of delay in development of depression, so probably if we ask people today, the numbers may be much higher. In addition, 85% experienced emotional, emotional difficulties related to either disconnection from their support systems or concern or anxiety about the future, mostly about their family members, uncertainty and the fear of being infected. 17% reported worsened economic situation. And while half a million elderly in Israel do not have basic digital literacy, meaning they do not have a set of knowledge and skills to manage their everyday life in digital surrounding, according to a survey, 16% cannot do even one simple digital action. At the same time, 36% reported that they learned some new computer skills. So it brings me to the conclusion that all programs in Israel should work to improve those strategic indicators and the corona has only strengthened them. The broad picture that emerges from the findings indicates that most of the elderly experienced the difficulties of the period in a manner adapted to their limitations and knew how to deal with them in a relatively adaptive way. Adaptive way. At the same time, the findings reveal specific population groups who seriously suffered from the crisis and experienced significant health or mental deterioration. These groups must be identified and featured in order to develop a targeted and tailored response to their needs. We are working very closely with the Israeli government and we hope the new government will approve this strategy in the nearest future. To conclude my talk and to open our discussion, I would like to share with you JDC Eshel's assumption for the future planning this is something which was shared with you in the PDF prior to the meeting, what Andre dropped in the Dropbox. You may have it in front of your eyes if you want. 
First of all, uh, approaching the planning in this uh, challenging period, we need to understand that we are not talking about the emergency situation, but the new way of life requires special planning attention. A lot of paradigms and life patterns changed. We need to understand what does it mean in this new reality, family, consuming, studies, saving, care, and the uh, reality is changing rapidly. In order to be relevant and to work effective, we need uh, to be involved into learning process constantly. In Eshel, we need constantly learn and change as we progress. And this is actually the way of uh, life we choose for ourselves. We remember that a lot of adults are still in isolation and that fact has implications, like we said, about loneliness, fragility, and so on. And aging at home, which is already the preferred option, will become almost a necessity following the corona and so developing community-based models is crucial. The situation also forces us to think about the life within the home. We should think how to make changes in the elderly home or room in the nursing facilities for better daily living in isolation for a long time. It's pretty clear also that there is a growing need for skills to, for self-managing elderly need to receive more skills and more knowledges for self-management. And if before Corona, we spoke about digital li literacy as a mandatory skill, now we understand that this is crucial skill. The technology will be crucial. However, I have to uh, mention that we all need to keep in mind that technology doesn't solve everything, it helps, but it doesn't replace the personal contact. One of the uh, central uh, corona consequences is ageism. We see in Israel that all the people who were let off during the pandemic will find it difficult to return to employment. So we are thinking about how to see them on this subject. And finally, with an optimistic frame of mind, we should consider what good will we derive from this. We must look to the future and think about what are the opportunities the corona brought with us with it. And I would like to invite us uh, to discuss these points in the upcoming conversation, thinking about strategic difference between short and long-term planning. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Sarah. Look, that was a fabulous opening um, set of remarks. You know, while we wait for questions to come in, you know, I just want to reflect back some of the words that you used, which really um, resonate with me. You know, this, you know, you talked about the art of the dance. And, and I haven't heard that before in the context of older people and transitioning, you know, to a new normal. So I think that's a you know, from sheltering to the dance of civilians. And that really makes sense to me. I think some of the other ones are that, you know, that we can't see future planning as an immediate response to an emergency. It's actually very different. Um, and I think that we can get caught up into thinking that this is an emergency that actually goes away. Whereas Eshel, JDC Eshel, are constantly looking at data from the voices of older people, um, which I think is, um, I wouldn't say unique, but it's, it's quite rare in an environment in which we're working. So the data that you've gathered is actually very accurate. You know, 51% decline in physical ability, 30% functional. But the thing that really caught my eye was the way that you actually um, talked about physical, the motivation and the catalyst to cognitive decline. 
And I think that's a relationship that, you know, we actually don't, don't necessarily make a lot of the time. So we do have some um, questions. So as we usually do, Ira, I'm going to ask two or three people to come forward with their question. Um, and so the first questions will be from uh, Cynthia Stewan. Cynthia, I envy you. You're down in Maine somewhere looking at the ocean. So welcome. Cynthia is our main representative at the uh, United Nations in New York. So Cynthia, um, Joanne Berrigan, and also from Narudu Gava Naradu. Um, so let's 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 do that. So Cynthia, Joanne, and uh, Naradu. Cynthia, floor is yours. Thank you. It's fascinating. I appreciate the presentation. I'm wondering uh, if you're finding more interest in people, older persons having been excluded from the digital uh, divide, if there might be more interest going forward in learning uh, digital skills. But secondarily, how is JDC Eschel planning to move forward with um, enhancement of digital skills for older persons in Israel? And we'll um, take, Ira, we'll just take the other two questions. Okay. Um, and uh, so Joanne Berry, did you want to make a comment? No, okay, we'll move on to Vijay. Vijay, my apologies, I didn't know it was you. So Vijay, would you like to ask uh, Ira the question? Hi, hello, thank you very much. Um, uh, back to this virtual conversation this conversation you know uh, thank you very much Rina um, as long as the older person is physically and mentally strong she or he can be trained with inverted commas into self-management now if that person has opted preferred home uh, aging aging at home and gradually finds himself or herself into having to be cared, need, needs the services of a carer. So how did that come in? I mean, how did transition takes place? Okay, um, over to you, Ira. Okay, Jane, I would appreciate if I, 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 I heard like in a very punctual manner the, the second question. So if you can please. Yeah, I, I will repeat. VJ, can you? Yes. Speak a little more slowly. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. That's all no, right, I'm, I've got different I'm, accents. Okay, um, you know, I've got a Mauritian accent, which is french -sized, you know. Uh, well, I was saying that um, as long as the older person is physically or mentally uh, fit, now that person can be trained into self-management, that is, Okay, so, so as to be uh, self-supporting. Now, if that person has chosen to, to uh, as preferred aging at home, and if that person is alone, alone without any other member of the family, how, how does that transition take place from being uh, independent and two, having to, 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 to needing access or services of a carer. Okay. Thank you, got it. Okay, so over Thank to you. you, Ira. So, um, okay, I'll try to address uh, uh, both questions. First of all, as I said, uh, digital literacy. We, long before Corona, we realized that there is a huge need among elderly to gain a uh, computer and digital skills. Not only, you know, not only uh, be able to open a computer, which is also good because it allows you to Skype with your family abroad or things like that, but the whole uh, life now, even if you want to, to make an appointment as a doctor or whatever, it's, everything now is digitalized. So. 
we found it very, very extremely important. So we started this program of digital literacy in Eshel with um, two providers, uh, uh, national providers in different frameworks, uh, learning a lot from the old organization in, in the United States, how to deliver the computer knowledge to elderly. Uh, in this way, we, as I said, we, the shift we are doing now is we understand that the, the, as, as, as more courses we will be able to open, more people will be able to join them. Actually, what I wanted to say that uh, during the corona, we moved almost all our services online, all courses moved online. The programs that I'm responsible for, the rehabilitation, we, we managed to provide remote rehabilitation services. It was challenging, it was difficult, but with um, a certain effort when you're trying to um, be very specific and you really know what you're going to do and what is the need, specific need of the person. For me, for example, it, for my mom, it was much more important to know how to make a Zoom conversation. For somebody else, it's a WhatsApp. So this is what we're trying to do, to, to provide a tailor-made answer for anybody while providing the a generic set of skills so people can move forward within the courses or out of the courses. Did I answer you, Cynthia? Thank you. About Thank you. the second question, um, what, what is good in Israel that we were the first country who declared the uh, long-term uh, care law in 1988. Due to this, 98% uh, of the elderly population live in the community. Only 2%, 2 and 2.7% 2 of elderly live in nursing homes. This is due uh, to the uh, very well-developed infrastructure of the uh, care workers who, uh, if in case the person cannot um, manage himself in active daily living or instrumental daily living. So uh, this, uh, this deficit can be compensated by the work of the uh, care worker. Um, we actually, when we speak about the self-management, we, we, we mean a, a big variety of uh, skills. For example, uh, chronic disease management. You know, it's not a secret that people are over 75 in, in average have at least uh, two chronic diseases. Better they manage them, the, 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 their health life is longer. So it, it's, it becomes, with the aging of population, it becomes crucial, more skills and knowledge we can give to people to keep their chronic diseases balanced, more chances for them to live independent life. Okay, Ira, um, thank you for those. We've got lots of questions. So I'll ask the, the people that are wanting to ask the questions to keep them tight so that Ira can then respond. So um, Kathy Klein, Audrey from Australia, and Joanne Berrigan. So Kathy. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, Ira, I wondered whether, and I haven't checked, I should, but I wondered whether Israel, as advanced as you are helping older people become independent, also prescribes to the World Health Organization age-friendly cities and communities framework that makes older people at the core of defining their own needs, which sounds like what you do anyway, but whether you use their framework and are accredited through them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Audrey? I'm just wondering how widespread lockup was. We had to, to be 
just about through the country that people in aged care facilities weren't allowed to go out, they were locked in their rooms and their families weren't allowed to see them and some just died there. I find it terribly cruel and I wonder if it was worldwide or just in Australia. Okay, so we'll take that question and uh, Joanne Berrigan. Okay, I'll, I'll ask the question on behalf of you, Joanne, and it also um, speaks to a question from Vinod Kumar, who's, they both asked about, you know, are there any interventions? Can you suggest anything that's not non, that, that is non-digital? Because there are older people around the world that either have absolutely no interest in uh, digital, and my 92 year old mother is exactly that, or they don't have access. So for those people, how, how, how does eShell manage that? So the first question is around um, age friendly cities and communities. Second question is around um, lockdown and what were the implications for that? And the third question is about um, non-digital um, options to engage older people. Okay, so I, I'll try to answer exactly in that order. Age-friendly cities. Um, I, I really want to say I have a dream when all Israeli cities will be age-friendly cities. We're in the very beginning of the process. We have 270 municipalities in Israel. Uh, the beginnings of the process of turning the cities into age-friendly uh, had been made uh, already uh, years ago with more or less success. There are 50 cities in Israel uh, which belong to the uh, world um, network of age-friendly cities or health-friendly cities. Uh, health cities actually. And there are many initiatives in almost every uh, municipality, which in this or that way um, connected to the concept of age-friendly cities. Uh, I may say that this is one of our uh, future strategic directions. It's pretty clear for us that if we want to uh, keep our elderly active, we need to think about their surroundings, both inside their homes, which will uh, be that way organized that it can promote some kind of uh, action, some kind of physical activity, and also accessibility uh, out of the home so uh, people can do their errands without any fear to fall or something like that. We're now working together with the Haifa Technion. Uh, um, they're trying to, trying, they're doing, they're developing a sort of application which will help elderly people both uh, to navigate and to find the, the best uh, road uh, uh, possible or matchable to uh, his or her personal needs. If, for example, person can go only 200 meters and he needed benches on the way in order to get to the bus stop, so he, he will be able to do that. It's not ready yet, but we're working hard on this. Um, the second question was about the um, locking uh, a residence of in nursing homes. The answer was yes. Our uh, residents in nursing homes were locked uh, with no possibility for visits, uh, their families, uh, their relatives. I must say that 41% uh, of deaths in Israel among elderly were in the nursing homes. And so it was quite a um, must to lock. However, very quickly, um, the army, Eshel, and the government, we get organized, and it was an initiative when 
with very, very simple infrastructure based on Skype. Why on Skype? Because Skype has an uh, um, opportunity to make an um, incoming call without uh, making the elderly person uh, learn something that he needs to, to press a button or to get connected to the internet, no need in that. So uh, the staff made a schedule for family members, members calls and uh, in many, many uh, nursing homes, residents had a possibility to have a phone conversation on Skype with their family members on the scheduled manner. Okay. And the last question is about, you know, are there any interventions that are not digital that Ishel is using? Uh, yes, uh, uh, a lot of community services used phones, just called on the phone and had a lot of conversation on the phone. We had a huge amount of volunteers from the population groups with when, which were not risk groups like teenagers or young people. And they had a very, very profound training before they entered elderly homes. Uh, our army organized together with the Ministry of Social Affairs and uh, they visited immediately a huge amount of elderly in order to provide a uh, basic needs and to uh, help some uh, basic assessment of the needs. Um, I think this more or less. And also we have a very well developed community infrastructure like supportive communities, like warm homes, uh, daycare centers. So the staff of all these institutions was in touch, mostly on the phone, with the, the members of their communities. So Ira, really what you've shared with us is a very close relationship between Eshel and the community. You know, you're able to tell us in quite some detail, you know, the programs and the process. And I think, you know, that's one of the gold standard messages that we need to take away. I also just wanted to mention that uh, Anna Sangster is on the line today. Anna Sangster is the program lead uh, for the WHO Age Friendly Cities and Communities program. So Aoife is very proud to be the secretariat for that global network. So just for your information. And Audrey, you know, it's such a quandary, isn't it? You know, around lockdown versus not lockdown. And uh, I see that Jane Teasdale from Mosaic is on the line today. Welcome, Jane. Um, Jane is the founder and, and CEO of Mosaic, um, which is a, a, a very strong provider of services and care in Canada. Now, you may have known, um, and if you don't, let me tell you, that, you know, the... the the rate of fatalities in Canada in nursing homes has been more than 80%. Um, and, but let me also say that there have been some facilities with no outbreaks um, and, you know, that have really done very well in, in the care and the safety. So there is a real balance around do you have, you know, the highest regard for in, infection control you know, do you have all the necessary equipment? Do you have the opportunities to actually connect residents with their family, you know, um, rather than opening it up for visitation? So I think we've le we're, we're learning hard lessons because some of our loved ones have died in terrible circumstances. And there are also situations where loved ones have been saved, you know, in these situations. So it's a very, very tough balance. I just want to go on and ask um, Bruce West and also um, Eileen from University of the Third Age. I've, I hope I remembered your name, Eileen. So Eileen and Bruce. Eileen, are you on the line? I am indeed, Jane, and you certainly remember my name and thank you very much. This was an excellent presentation. We in Ireland, we're on a phase three and we're opening up more or less for everybody else with individual behavioural responsibility being at the core. However, for older people who've been cocooned to protect 
there is a protectionism and cocooning mindset still around. Regardless, it's just a chronological age division. But when I'm looking at your fundamental assumptions for future planning, which is a great template, do you have any specific action items for implementation under that framework that might be of help, considering that we're told still stay at home, but only make a judgment if you have to go out. Okay, thanks Eileen and uh, welcome. And Bruce. Hi, good morning, Jane. I, um, we, we've, following the, um, the changes that we've had to implement during COVID, we're, we're having meetings like this, where um, spending a lot, lot less time um, uh, the, uh, going out of the uh, of the house uh, shopping, um, people are um, uh, finding ways of visiting with their loved ones in long term care facilities by Skype or or other approaches. We we've just we've changed the way we operate. We're adjusting to that new way of operating, and I'm just curious as to whether you think that um, these changes could become permanent some some of the it's just going to change the way we're um in, interacting with each other um the way we visit people in long-term care facilities the the just you know are, are some of these changes going to be permanent i guess is is the, the question that i'm asking cheap as i hope not bruce you know i live on hugs right and i'm <laughs> i'm bereft um, <laughs> But let me uh, ask Ira. Ira, um, first of all, we've had a question from Eileen and then Bruce. Okay. Um, challenging. Um, is the recommendation on our 10 basic assumptions. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking how to handle this question in brief because uh, the, 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 the short answer is yes. We do have some recommendations on a uh, specific recommendation on this uh, basic assumptions. For example, um, what we can uh, make, uh, what kind of tools or instruments we can provide to our elderly so they wouldn't be sitting at home doing nothing while isolation or even not while isolation, when they have to stay at home. You know, it's not a secret. Old people um, many times are forced to sit at home or due uh, bad health or whatever. I, I can give you one of the examples that we made during the corona. We, we distributed about 35,000 activity kits, uh, which consisted of different items starting from the Pilates ball and the uh, uh, ribbon rope to uh, crosswords and Sudoku to, to promote person's activity in any way possible, or it's physical activity, or it's uh, mental activity, or just a nice uh, time spending, like uh, we, we provided them with a kit of drawing pencils and papers. As simple as that, but when uh, someone who feels frustrated and disconnected receive a, so simple a present, very, very cheap. Uh, it, it, it gives him um, double motivation. First, that someone thought about him and he doesn't feel alone anymore. Second, that it was uh, compiled with the uh, assistance of professionals, uh, occupational therapists uh, uh, who very well are familiar and acquainted with what a uh, elderly can do. And th that's, that was the way that we com uh, uh, combined this, uh, this set. And it, it, this worked pretty good. We received wonderful feedbacks for that. And a lot of municipalities wanted then Afterwards, they, they um, bought much more. Uh, another kind of activity is that we, uh, we recorded a lot of very short instruction films. We uh, published a lot of very short and simple uh, booklets 
in, diff in I think in five or six different languages in Russian, in Hebrew, in Arabic, in English. So um, in adjustable funds. So people could do something with their lives while at home. And this one of the uh, lessons that we take with us in the future uh, during, for, for the dance period, thinking what kind of simple tools can help a person stay active at home. This is one of the examples. Did I answer? Okay, so... Um, uh, so sorry, sorry, just on reopening and participation in society, this is the next phase for everybody. We don't want to be staying at home, we want to be out in society. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I mostly related to the, the, the situation when the person needs to stay at home, but I, I'll tell you uh, about another experience that was made in, the, in different uh, municipalities that during specific hours, uh, public uh, um, gardens and parks were opened for elderly. And one of the ideas that we're trying to develop uh, that this uh, open hours will be filled with a uh, quality of content. So it will be not just only for, for work, but also for conversation, for a sort of company, uh, companionship, and maybe, you, you know, we live in Israel, we, it's, uh, most of the year is summer, so it's, 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 it's good for us. And uh, for a certain period of day, people can just go out or could go out. And maybe this is one of the recommendations that we already also gave to the prime minister offices for, to, to, to consider. Okay, thank you, Ira. And the final question from Bruce. Uh, it was about permanent uh, changes, right? Yes, yes, it was. I want to be a proverb and to say I know what, what will be permanent or, will be, or what will not be permanent. I mostly think that independently or permanent or not permanent changes, we need to develop a wide variety of skills and tools to address any um, fluid situation. Um, we, we used to speak about that there is nothing more uh, permanent these days than, uh, than a change. So I think that the only thing which is really constant is a change. Though it's, though it's a slogan, but there is something in this sentence that has a huge influence on our everyday lives. So I, um, I think that we need to develop within ourselves um, enough skills and enough tools to be able to address any situation which we can potentially face in the nearest future. So Ira, I'm going to just give you a few minutes to put some thoughts together for your closing message. Um, but I just do want to just ask everybody to refer to the chat box um, Jane Teasdale has, um, you know, put some important information in there about advanced pandemic protocols uh, and also um, you're starting um, poll walking groups in the middle of July. So well done you, Jane. Um, you know, some of the things that really touched me as you were talking and responding to the questions was around, you know, the nature of society. You know, there's no question that JDC eShell uh, e is a sophisticated organisation in being able to respond quickly. But you can only respond if you actually understand the unique needs of older people. And I think you rightly said that, you know, um, older people are not a homo hom homogeneous group. And it's the same the world over. So... What you've been able to understand is the unique needs of various populations and perhaps even individuals in being able to respond. Uh, and that takes coordination. Um, coordination and the ability to share. You know, what Aoife knows about JDC Isham is the unconditional 
sharing of information. And that's good for us because as you can see, there are some principles um, and clear strategies and actions that are working in Israel. And so I encourage you to gather up uh, the information that Andra is going to send out, but also visit the website, you know, which is, which is very clear and resources are available. I'm also conscious about the, the emphasis on connection. You know, it wasn't only the parcel and the gift, but it was this connection that was being made to older people. And I think that sometimes even more important than what's, what's being received, it's that connection that's important. I think also I'm conscious of language that has developed, you know, in, uh, in times of COVID. And one word, one phrase that is irritating to me is the social distancing. You know, I understand physical distance, but I think this social distance, you know, is, you know, we should, we should call it out. But also, Eileen, you used a word that seems very specific to Ireland, and that's cocooning, um, you know, being, being in shelter. So just as we go forward with these town halls, I think it's important that we note the language that's been created and actually question whether we want to keep that language. Uh, Christine has said distant socially, socialising. Um, so I think that could be something that we think about as we go forward with these town halls. Now I'm going to turn the floor back to Ira because we always ask our, our uh, experts for takeaway messages. So back to you, Ira. Um. First of all, I really would like to thank everybody for uh, your attention and for your passion and for your uh, desire to uh, to listen and to uh, I, I saw just a couple of uh, chats thanking for sharing information. For us, it's basic. We always share. We, it's our privilege to be able to share the information. Eshel is. Um, a wonderful organization and I'm very proud to be a part of it and join the both as the public trust and the governmental trust. We have a very high professional team and this is exactly what allow us to do what Jane mentioned to be from the one hand to monitor very closely what is going on in the field and to uh, to transfer, to provide, to, to pass the, the needs to the decision makers, but not only to pass the needs to the decision makers, also to suggest or to offer possible solutions for this or that kind of problem. Um, I, I really want to address the, the statement of cocooning. It, it touched me personally because um, my mom came to Israel when she was 65. Quite, you know, quite a respectful age. Uh, and she was a bit uh, angry on me when, um, to her opinion, too often I told, I told her mom, you can do it yourself. Mom, you can do it yourself. I was moved by the fact that my mom is clever that my mom is smart, that my mom can, if, if, I, if I'll do it uh, instead of her, she will never learn how to do it. Now, during the corona, she knew how to use internet, how to use Facebook, how to, how to, how to, how to join the family conversation group on Zoom. So, and she said, you know what? Now I know how right you were then. Because you forced me in a very gentle manner, I must say, to learn new things, to, to learn new stuff, and you didn't live uh, my life instead of me. I think that this is one of the things that we need to remember all the time when we speak about the caring of uh, elderly population. They're clever, they're smart, they're experienced, they know a lot of things, and our role and our uh, main role must be to support, to help, and not to replace them. 
And about the isolation, um, I think I would like to put it that way. Uh, to be isolated doesn't mean to stay disconnected. We need to think about every way possible to keep our uh, parents and our grand -great parents um, to stay connected in every way possible. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's Corona time or it's not Corona time, we need to keep them connected. One of the most touching examples from the Corona time was when uh, one of the very uh, old, uh, this is a real example. Um, one of the, uh, I think he was like about 85 years old, one old guy who was hospitalized and he didn't see his family for weeks. His situation get worse and worse until one day two volunteers came to him with a tablet and, con and contacted him, um, connected him, sorry, with his wife. Believe it or not, he became, uh, he began to recover. This is the, the treatment, the cure for social isolation, to keep people connected to their families, to their support groups, to their surroundings. So, Ira, thank you very much for really reflecting some of the fine work of uh, JDC Eshel today, but most importantly, to give us a glimpse inside, you know, how, you know, the Israeli society really is responding to the needs of older people. You know, the phrase that I will take away from this town hall and use in the future is, may we all join the art of the dance as we go forward. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure for you to be with us today, as well as Hani and Noam from, uh, from JDC Ishel. I thank Andra Stanku and uh, the IFA staff and all the reps on the line. So thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you all next week uh, when we have a conversation with Dr. Amy Dupree about those tough conversations in times of crisis. So, Stay safe, stay well, and we look forward to next week.